Mini episode 864 of the FDH Lounge is brought to you by Sportsology, delivering unconventional columns and webcasts about sports, TV, music, movies, and more. Follow them on the web at sportsology.com. The FDH Lounge. You want to schedule your life around it. A long time ago, on a gloomy, wet Cleveland spring night, two men stand alone amidst the late night drizzle. Their voices echo across the vacant station parking lot as they debate the merits of the great American radio show that have been missing for far too long. On that night, an idea was born. That idea became the FDH Lounge. Welcome to the FDH Lounge. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FDH Lounge mini episode number 864. You have with you today FDH Lounge dignitaries Rick Morris and Steve Callis. And we are convening to discuss something that uh, we said we would uh, discuss. I believe we talked about this as far ago as uh, April, back when the NBA regular season was winding down. The specific comparisons being made between the MVP season, Russell Westbrook had the triple-double season, and the only previous one in NBA history that Oscar Robertson put up in 1961-1962. And uh, I believe that we had a little bit of a discussion off-air and said once it becomes official and the NBA has gifted the MVP award to Westbrook, we will convene and discuss this. And specifically, a column that Steve has, you can find it on the FDH Lounge uh, blog, the FDH Lounge Multimedia Magazine. It is from April 17th of this year. So a uh, quick search under the month of April and it'll pop right up. It is entitled Westbrook v. Harden v. Oscar, really. And he laid it out in a lot of detail there. And what we're going to do also, too, this is going to be a little bit uh, of an appetite uh, setter for subsequently, I'm hoping, I'm putting a pin in this saying hopefully later in the summer, I am targeting an FDH lounge discussion. We're going to do some limited balloting along the lines of the Pantheon, but with all the talk in the last year or so about all-time greats, LeBron, Jordan, where does everybody stack up, we're going to do an NBA Top 10, and I'm going to do uh, a, a, a ballot with a limited number of FDH Lounge dignitaries and other contributors to the show. Uh, this is not going to be as widespread as the FDH uh, Lounge uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences, which casts the ballots for the Pantheon. I'm going to target this to the serious hoop heads, and I have one of them with me here today. Our topic here today is going to be Westbrook uh, versus Harden versus Oscar, really, as the column says. But essentially, Westbrook, Oscar, apples and oranges from different eras. So it's going to be a taste for the broader discussion to come. This is going to be a little bit more narrowly limited to triple-double season v. triple-double season and how it all shakes out. I know you have some very, very strong thoughts on this, Steve, and anybody that read this column, and hopefully it's been widely read, uh, would agree that you made many, many, many excellent points. Well, I just think it's so unfair to Oscar, who's almost like the forgotten superstar. I'll tell you right now, he's going to be number one on my list when you send that out to the people you're going to send it out to. But here's a guy who actually averaged a triple-double. If you add up all of his stats for his first five years, if you add up games played each year, add them up, not a seasonal total, but add up 78 games here, 80 games there, 75 there. The games, points, assists, rebounds for the first five years of Oscar Robertson's career, he averaged a triple-double. Yeah. Um, I understand, don't get me wrong, what Westbrook did is amazing. He's a tremendous talent. He's a tremendous athlete. He's got a big work ethic. You know, he was never going to do that with Kevin Durant on his team. I don't think he'll do it with... Uh, with Paul George on this team, uh, we'll have to see, but I don't think that's going to happen. But Oscar's numbers from the 1960 to 61 season through 64-65, he averaged 30.3 points per game, 10.6 assists per game, and 10.4 rebounds per game. That's beyond staggering. And if you're not as tough a grader as I am, if you throw in his six-year stats, he would actually have a six-year rebounding average of 9.99. I did not round that up to 10. So you can make a case that he actually did it for six years. So again, specifically with a then versus now, we know all the more possessions back then, poorer shooting, all of that is true. But the things that bother me, I'm looking more in the present than in the past. Oscar did what Oscar did. As he said many times, nobody knew what a triple-double was then. Nobody cared. We didn't talk about it. Nobody tried for it. Oh, he's got eight assists. He needs two more for the triple-double. That never happened in the 60s. But with Westbrook, as you know, 
that did happen this year, and a number of times, there's an interesting video that I referenced a number of times, ESPN's Tom Haberstraw, that just shows a few times, for example, on the rebounding front, the two big men on OKC who were under the basket on the foul shot, they were told to box out their man, and Westbrook would come in and get the rebound. There's a stat in the NBA, I don't know how many years it's been on, called uncontested rebounds. Nobody, since they've been keeping the stat, no guard has ever led the league in uncontested rebounds. Westbrook did this year. The other nine guys in the top ten were all big men. Why did that happen? Well, watch the Hapistro video. He gives you at least one example where, again, Adams and I forget the other big guy, they box their man out so there's nobody there. Westbrook comes in and gets the rebound. Um, more interesting angle with assists, of course, and then I'll stop for a minute because I want you to contribute as well. But with the assists, back when Oscar played, it seems like if you passed the ball to a guy who took a dribble and scored, you did not get an assist back then. Hard to pinpoint the exact rule. All I'll say is much harder to get an assist when Oscar played than when Westbrook plays. Now, as you know, if you get the ball and you dribble and lay it in, that's definitely an assist. Back when Oscar played, not so much. So you look at his numbers, and his assist numbers should be two or three a game here, one or two or three, and conversely, you look at Westbrook, number if he played under the Oscar rules, his would be one or two or three lower, and Westbrook had 10, 10 triple-doubles when he had 10 assists, and seven triple-doubles when he had 11, so you have to think a lot of those would not have even been triple-doubles, and the final thing I'll say is everyone made a big deal out of Westbrook breaking Oscar's record, Westbrook had 42 triple-doubles on the last day of the year, Oscar had 41, but when Oscar played, it was an 80-game season. When Westbrook plays, it's an 82-game season. If Oscar had two more games, he might have had no more triple-doubles. He might have had one more triple-double. He might have had two. If he had two, beat Westbrook. When he tied Westbrook, you understand what I'm saying. you got to look at everything in context. Absolutely. And uh, in, in one gulp there, you actually summed up many of your uh, big points from the column. Uh, I'll, I'll just say that... This is one of these things there, but when we talk about, uh, you know, sentient beings and artificial intelligence and that kind of stuff, it's generally <laughs> about robots, right, and looking into the future. You, you can look at it through the same prism with human beings and the NBA 50 to 60 years apart, because as you said, you know, man did not have the capacity in the 60s to understand what a triple-double was and all these other things, and, you know, the, the evolution of man as embodied by Russell Westbrook in 2016-2017, who, again, it has been said in recent years, you know, did do some politicking with the stat guys there about, uh, you know, I deserved one more of this or that. or I mean, points are pretty straightforward. You can't politic for that. But assists and rebounds can always be litigated, and uh, he has allegedly done a fair amount of that. So w when you look at it, what, what just really bothers me about this argument here, because everything you're saying is so self-evidently true, but we, in, in these dumbed-down, mouth-breathing times in which we live, I, I see this all the time. People on social media that just want to point to, but it was a triple-double for the whole year! And you could lay everything out for 10 minutes, and all they come back with is, but it was a triple-double for the whole year! It's just a shame that, that so much of this uh, very critical and intelligent commentary on your part is just not capable of penetrating the skulls of a lot of people today in today's sports landscape. Well, I think a lot of times, again, we don't know if sports was invented in 1979 when the ESPN was, right. or uh, a few years later when Magic and Lowry revived the NBA, speaking specifically about the NBA. Um, but again, the, the focus on the individual stat. I mean, in 61-62, Will Chamberlain averaged 50 points and 25 rebounds. I mean, imagine if someone did that today. He, of course, as everyone knows, on March 2nd, 1962, scored 100 points in a game against the Knicks. No TV coverage, no film of it. All you see is the sign after the game, Will holds a piece of paper with somebody wrote 100 on it. And these are mythical things, except they happened. And I understand they happened in the 60s, and I understand that's 50, 55, whatever, years ago now. Um, but these things actually happened. Uh, I don't think anyone with a brain who has seen any tape of Will Chamberlain saw him play live or looks at his statistics, that combination, if you understand that, you understand if he showed up in the NBA today, he'd be a dominant player. Now, you can tell me the game has changed, everybody's shooting threes, but he would still be a physically dominant player, maybe the most physically 
dominant player in the history of the NBA. The only guy I would remotely compare him to, and I said remotely compare, is a young Shaq in terms of physical dominance. So you had guys like that back then, and I'll read you what the logo Jerry West said, because this probably means more than my whole article. Quote, Jerry West, quote, when I look back on my career, Oscar is the greatest I ever played against, period. This Oscar played against Wilt, Russell, played with Baylor, pick a name, Jerry West played with him or against him. So that maybe tells you more than any stat, but we are a stat-oriented lunatic society now. Stats have always been important to some degree, but now to me it's gone uh, way over the top. No, I would totally agree with that. And again, I was the sole person back in, I think it was 2008 when we did, I think it was in the first Pantheon, casting a ballot for Oscar Robertson for best basketball player of all time. Of course, I was swamped by the Jordan votes. Uh, that must have been before you came into the fold, or you probably would have joined me in voting for the Big O. But in, in looking at it again, and it was it was a lonely vote, and I was getting a lot of stuff from people like, but you never saw him play. But again, this is just why what you're saying is near and dear to my heart because I have long championed. I, I, I'm big on the forgotten guys. You know, I, I, I'm, the, I'm the same guy that voted for Walter Johnson for best baseball pitcher. Uh, when shamefully, Fantastic. yeah, shamefully, the first time we, we did that, uh, it was a vote for. Uh, uh, the vote ended up going to Nolan Ryan, which we ended up uh, vacating that and doing it a second time, uh, just Good. because, uh, yeah, with, 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 all, with all due respect to Nolan Ryan, uh, I, I think he would be embarrassed to tell you that he won that thing. Nolan Ryan knows his place in baseball history, which is to say Hall of Fame, deservedly so, maybe even first ballot, but not the best pitcher of all time. But in this column also, too, I just can't say enough to keep putting over this column, which you can find in the, uh, the April 2017 archives on the FDH Lounge blog. Also mentioning in there one of my favorite overlooked players in basketball history, Tiny Archibald, and how he factors in here uh, with uh, James Harden and, and, and the season that, again, in many ways was comparable to what Westbrook did, in many ways was not comparable, but they kind of tended to get lumped together since Harden had sort of a near triple-double for the year. But I really liked you invoking Tiny Archibald on there as well because he's another victim of this whole culture of, but I never saw him play. How good can he be? Well, again, the only guy in the history of the league to lead the league in scoring and assists in the same year, you know. And you understand what breath that takes in of every player who ever played, every great scorer, every great passer. That's a stunning thing. Um, I did see Tiny Archibald a few times and actually stood next to him once in the high school gym in the Bronx. Uh, you may recall this, Rick, but in the 70s, um, the NBA at halftime had something called the one-on-one -on -one competition, and they literally had players play against each other in high school gyms, tape it during the week, play it on halftime. I'm surprised uh, at classic sports if someone hasn't picked them up. And Tiny Archibald was like my hero. I was a little point guard at Powell Memorial 100 years ago. And he came to my girlfriend's gym at Cardinal Spellman to play Connie Hawkins. And I, wow. was dumb enough to believe, I was dumb enough to believe that Tiny Archibald could beat Connie Hawkins one-on-one. -on -one. Of course, he didn't. But uh, it was a high school gym. I had seats way down. I actually stood up when he walked into the gym. He literally walked by me. I, at the time, was maybe 5'10". There was no chance he was bigger than me, and he was already in a, an NBA star. So when they list him at 6'1", and I understand smaller players in the NBA, in college, even in high school, like to have their height listed taller than they are, but I would bet that Tiny Archibald is not six feet. When they talk about Iverson, great little man, I would bet that he's not even 5'11". But I wish somebody could check that out because he is one of the greatest little point guards of all time. Now, like Westbrook, I will say this. He was on not a very good team, the Kansas City Omaha Kings, if you can remember them. So, yes, Tiny had the ball virtually all the time. But knowing that he was virtually going to have the ball all the time and they weren't a good team, everybody ganged up on him. He still averaged 30 points a game per game. And the thing with Harden is this new stat points accounted for. If I score a basket, I accounted for two points. But if I pass to you and you score a basket, I've accounted for four points. And so with that stat, um, again, because to me, Harden had 262 three-pointers. Tony Archibald never made one. Tiny Archibald had more assists than Harden that year, 
and many more points. He had 400, I'm trying to do the math in my head, it's like 350 more points than Harden. And Harden hit 262 threes that Tiny could never do. So to me, these are not comparisons, Rick. This would be like, wait, they changed the game. You could now score three. I could only score two. As I said, Oscar only had an 80-game season, and Westbrook had an 82-game season. Now, do these things mean a lot on the overall scheme of things? I think they do if you're going to talk about Harden, the all-time record for points accounted for. I think that means something. It certainly means something to me. So I just want people to understand it's kind of like points in hockey now. You can you can get, they can give out three points in the hockey game now. If yeah. you're tied at the end of regulation, they're giving out three points. As you know, in the old days, they gave out, each team got one, and that was it. So when you put a team with the NHL on points today and compare them to the 76-77 Canadians, one of the greatest teams ever, you shouldn't really compare them because you can get one or two points in the game now, and that has never happened in the history of hockey until whenever they've done it, what, the last, I'm going to guess, 10 years or so. So I think, again, everything in context, you really have to look a little bit. And to me, it's not hard to look, although you're correct. A lot of people think the 70s didn't exist. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. I had never even heard of that thing with uh, the uh, halftime segments and everything like that. Your, your story of that, that is one of the coolest uh, encounter with an athlete stories that I've ever heard of getting to see something like that in person. That must have been just amazing. And uh, amazing. again, yeah, I, I I can't even imagine being there for something like that. That is so unbelievably and, cool in a tiny venue. And by the way, Hawkins killed him. But oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that's you know, you you you, you get disabused of your notions sometimes when you see things play out before your own two eyes. The one thing I'm going to throw up here, and again, I, I'm going to throw a thing up here that is going to be a little bit of a devil's advocate thing here. Uh, just a, a point about Oscar Robertson, just because, again, you and I are very big fanboys, but uh, in order to keep, some, keep it fair, I want to raise a point that I read about him that would be somewhat of a countering point to you and I calling him potentially the greatest player of all time, and that being when uh, a number of years ago, Bill Simmons was booked to come on the show. This is when his book of basketball was out. And I got the thing in, in the mail uh, from his publisher. And then, uh, for whatever reason, uh, it, he, he wasn't uh, you know, amenable to getting scheduled, which I always laughed about that and thought, you know what, it's a $30 book, buddy. I'm the one that got over on you. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a great book. I would have loved to, in, in all seriousness, I would have loved to have interviewed Bill Simmons and, and would look forward to hopefully doing so someday because it would be an interesting conversation. But... In his thing about Oscar Robertson, and I don't remember the exact place that he put him, but it was somewhere around seven or eight. And, and, and he had a lot of arguments in there for all the players that were statistical arguments along the lines of what we're talking about. And then there were other types of arguments. And I, and I, I personally don't believe that stats can tell us every last thing about this. I think there is room for incorporating other perspectives as well. His perspective was that the big O, I don't know if necessarily – the word would be poisonous. That's probably way too strong. But as a teammate, he was listing story after story of just like he scared the crap out of his teammates. They were like terrified to miss a shot around him. They played on eggshells, it seems like, a lot of times. And in terms of uh, only winning that title late in his career, could have potentially had something to do with that. So any kind of deleterious effects as a teammate, which it sounds like he might have had, to what degree do you take that into account as far as offsetting him potentially being the greatest player of all time just looking at on court? Well, I would say this. Um, I think without a doubt Oscar was a perfectionist. I would refer people. Let me just tell you a quick story about Bill Simmons' book because I never got to the time if I see it in where I'll look. But I did see that Walt Frazier, in my opinion, one of the greatest guards of all time, was ranked 31, and Allen Iverson, who I also love, was ranked 28. And under no definition of basketball could you put Allen Iverson ahead of Walt Frazier. And the reason I stopped reading the book, actually, the guy had given it to me, I gave it back to him, was because under the Walt Frazier thing, Simmons wrote, my father was the happiest man in the world when the Knicks traded um, Frazier to the Cavaliers. He told me that the greatest backcourt of all time is Michael Jordan and Walt Frazier because Walt Frazier just killed the Celtics during those New York Knicks years. And so Simmons actually wrote, that's good enough for me, 
So he ranks Jordan 1, I believe. Yeah. And ranks Frazier 31. So I remember giving the book back to my friend and saying, uh, Bill Simmons' father should have written this book because he totally got it. Now, I'm not going to tell you, I will make a case that Frazier is one of the five greatest guards of all time. I'm not going to tell you the greatest backcourt of all time is Jordan and Frazier, especially since I think Oscar would be in there. But with respect to Oscar, I would tell people to go read his autobiography. I think it's called The Big O. But I recently read it, and what you can tell from that is, A, he was a perfectionist, B, he was very demanding, See the notion that the teams that he was on were going to beat the Bill Russell, Bob Cousy, Red Auerbach Celtics um, uh, is really almost far-fetched. Although, again, if you read the book, there were a few times, I think, early in his career, they took the Celtics to seven and didn't win. So would that make me knock him down because teammates were afraid of him because he was a perfectionist and a demanding guy? Uh, that would knock knock him down, in my opinion. Uh, I think if you read his book and look at the team that he was on, which at times was a good team, uh, I don't think you would think, although he did, they were ever a threat to really dethrone the you know, Boston Celtics of a time when, of course, that could not happen today. You know, Red Auerbach always said, always thought he was a better coach than Phil Jackson because Phil Jackson never built a team from scratch, and we just saw the debacle with the Knicks the last four years, and Phil Jackson's one attempt to build a team. His point was, you know, Jordan and Pippen, uh, Shaq and Kobe, whereas whatever you think of Auerbach, he did build the Celtics from scratch. He was fortunate, obviously, to get Russell, <laughs> but uh, I just find it interesting, and I don't think his attitude towards other players, if he had given them a pat on the butt as opposed to glaring at them, I don't think that would have ever gotten them over the hump. He was in a time, like I'll use Patrick Ewing on the Knicks, was in a time when, you know, they should have beat Houston that year, but essentially if Jordan and the Bulls were around, the Knicks were not going to beat them. And I think it was worse for not just Oscar, how about West and Beller uh, with the Lakers, two of the greatest players ever, who could never beat the Celtics, because the Celtics were head and shoulders at a time when you can keep all your players, and that's what the Celtics did. Absolutely, uh, and, and a couple of things there. The Iverson thing, that book came out, I believe, in 2009. So while Iverson was on the back end, he wasn't even done with his career yet. So it's especially staggering to think of where he was slotted before his career was even finished. I'll say this also, too, a very interesting piece of trivia. When you're looking at the best players of all time, uh, in, in terms of who are the plausible candidates for number one, or at least to be in the top ten, You've got LeBron as a guy who played home games in Cleveland, and we tend to think of him as being the only one. I mean, as much as I'm a homer for Price and Doherty and whatever and those great teams back in the day, no, they're not top ten guys of all time. Oscar Robertson also played some home games in Cleveland because when he played for the Cincinnati Royals back in the day, they did occasionally play some games. I don't know if it was the Cleveland Arena or where it was, but uh, they played some home games, not too many, I don't think, but at least a handful of them in Cleveland. So something that Big O and LeBron have in common, as well as all the stylistic uh, similarities of their game. Yeah, and he does go into the reason. I don't know if it's one of the owners was from Cleveland, but he does go in his autobiography. He does go into the reasons why they did play in Cleveland. I think it might have been more than a handful for a few years. But, yeah, your point is well taken. Just another thing, and, and I don't know, and, and I'm not – big into home court advantage, although I think it does matter. Uh, I don't know that it was really a rah-rah Cleveland fan base for the uh, Cincinnati Royals. No. Well, it might have been. It might have been, but you know what I'm saying. But again, I would refer people to that book. I find it to be a fascinating book, and I don't think he really covers much up and admits that he was a very demanding guy. Exactly, and, and I just wanted to bring that up because it's the one notable thing that when I remember yes. from that book with Bill Simmons talking about Oscar Robertson because, and, and again, and he, a, a lot of it is from Simmons's perspective, the whole thing of what, what and again, melodramatically, what he calls the secret as far as, you know, like I think basically shorthand for the secret to being a winner, to bringing other people along with you, to being a great teammate, 
whatever. Now, interestingly enough, again, the fact that Jordan is number one on the list with a bullet uh, when he shares a lot of the same attributes with Oscar Robertson, uh, I think is highly contradictory and something that I would like to throw at uh, Bill Simmons uh, if I ever got a chance to interview him as well as, again, me being a homer and saying, how is Mark Price not among the top 96 of all time? But, you know, that, that's another gripe for another day, I'm afraid. But, uh you know, yeah, this, uh, again, this column you had, uh, I can't say enough about it. You can find it on the FDH Lounge blog. Westbrook v. Harden v. Oscar, really, from April 17th of this year. So you can find it very quickly in the April archives at the FDH Lounge Multimedia Magazine, the fdhlounge.blogspot.com, so you can find it there. And uh, again, I looked forward to breaking this down with you uh, because I'm looking at the date of this thing here, and I think... Uh, from when this went up, from from when I got it, I think you and I actually talked on Easter. I have a I, I have a memory of on Easter I was riding in a car with my dad and was talking to you about this, and you indicated this column was coming, and I, I said to you, I said this will be a hell of a segment. Let's do a segment after they make it official and give it to Westbrook. And I already then I was starting to think of this broader top ten discussion that I'm looking forward to opening up. So uh, this was a very good lid lifter for what's to come, my friend, giving people a good flavor of it and uh, a great conversation with you as always. Great to be with you as always. Looking forward to the next one, Rick. Excellent, my friend. Thank you so much, and thank you, everybody, for joining us for FDH Lounge Mini Episode number 864. As we bring the show to a close, we would like to extend our deepest gratitude to NBC, CBS, ABC, Fox, all clear channel affiliates, TNT, TBS, USA, UPN, Deadspin.com, YouTube.com, YTMND.com, MySpace.com, various blogs, Fox News, CNN, CNBC, MSNBC, IamBoard.com, Billboard.com, Google.com, ESPN, ESPN2, ESPN News, ESPN Classic, NBA TV, NFL Network, Sports Time Ohio. Ohio, Athlon Magazine, Comedy Central, Cartoon Network, The Boomerang Channel, QBC, BET, The Spice Channel, Steno Notebooks, Manwich, Papermate Office Supplies, Waitresses, Strippers, Bartenders, Garbage Men, Janitors, Microwave Popcorn, The Writers of The Office, Scrubs, Entourage, My Name is Earl, Oz, Metalocalypse, and The Boondocks, Aquafina, and The Periodic Table of Elements. 